And we are proud to uh, have today our uh, very own Yom Zon. He'll tell us about left barrel loss for unbiased survival analysis prediction. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ron, very much for the invitation. And uh, thank you for everyone who's here. Uh, so, uh, it's a really long time since I had the honor and the opportunity to talk here. And I, I'll try uh, to explain, to give first a kind of a general framework to one approach to machine learning, and then to discuss a problem in this framework in a given uh, context, and then to try to show a solution uh, we had for this problem. And, and maybe uh, I'll start with, with the source of where we started and uh, what led us uh, to the situation. So it all started with a really, really, really strange question, which is the following. Suppose uh, I take a person, I have a person, and uh, this person has all kinds of demographics, like age, like uh, weight, like history of diseases, like if he had CMV or anything like that. But these demographics are tabular, so a list of values, and of a low dimension, say, I don't know, just a small number of such uh, demographics. And in addition to that, I have some biological data. Now, the problem with biological data is uh, twofold. One, that it's very noisy. In what sense it's very noisy? If I take the same measurement over and over and over again, I'll keep getting different results. And the other problem, which is probably more important, is that it resides in a very, very high dimension, like 1,000 or 10,000 dimensions. So I have lots of data, uh, very, very noisy. And from the combination of these two things, I'm trying to ask a simple question. When will I, when will an event happen? Or oh, uh, more specifically, <laughs> I would like to be, let's call this vector x1 and this vector x2. And I would like to have a function f of x1 and x2. <laughs> and that f of x1 and x2 would produce a time tau tilde, and the tau tilde would be a good estimator of the real time that such an event would happen. I obviously do not know what f is, but I do have some examples. So I have some examples of first x1, <laughs> x2, and the observed tau. And I want to take all these examples and produce this function with two main limitations. One limitation is that it's much easier to take a person in a hospital or anywhere and get its, its uh, demographic data to not you to do any kind of biological measurement. So often X2 is missing. And the other problem is that I do not observe tau for everyone. So for some people, I do observe tau, but for other people, I never observe tau. So if I would look at any kind of experiment that I set up, the person got into the experiment, say, at time zero, and left the experiment for all kinds of reasons at time t, where t may differ between the different people in the experiment, for some people, I observed the event tau here, but for other people, I never observed the event tau. So tau may have happened here, or actually may never have happened. I can never know that because I only have observation between time zero and time t. The event of such a missing tau is called sensory. <clears throat> so some kind of event prevents me from observing the event I'm interested in. 
So now we have two times. We have the event time, which we can call tau, and we have the censoring time, which you can call T. Both of these events happen with some probability. So I can have <laughs> a probability, say, G of T given X and a probability H of tau given X. So, and the probabilities can be very different. For example, the probability the event tau can be Yoram gives a call of view. The probability T can be Yoram is fired from Barilan. Obviously, Yoram cannot give a call of view after he's fired from Barilan. I mean, he wouldn't like to after it's fired, right? <laughs> but, uh, the event and the distribution of the time of the time t and of the time tau may be completely different. There is no reason on earth for time tau and time t to have similar association with any kind of input x. Do we understand the general problem of uh, censoring? Censoring is a crucial problem when you analyze real life data and you have a time to an event because things always happen. So whatever your experiment is, there are all kinds of things that will prevent you to see the entire data. There are all kinds of reasons for people to be left out of the experiment at some time t during your experiment. So the problem of trying to estimate this f, given the fact that they have censoring, is called time to event predictions. And there are two to three uh, main approaches and all are very uh, problematic. But before I explain the problem, I have to go back to another completely different question, which is how we do machine learning. By the way, feel free to ask questions along. I mean, I feel way better because I'm convinced that at least one of you is awake. So let's go back to how we do machine learning. So. Uh, a discriminatory uh, or machine learning or uh, predictive machine learning will ask the following question. I have some mm -hmm. export, uh, input X and I want to get some output Y. So I actually would like Y to be some kind of function of X. Now there is a strong assumption uh, in machine learning, which is the following. We assume that y is distributed somehow nicely around f of x. So suppose that y is a continuous variable, then we actually assume that y has a normal distribution with some variant sigma around f of x. Okay, and we further assume a lot of assumptions, but the two main assumptions are one, that uh, all our observations are IAD. So that we can treat all our observations as completely independent observation. And two, that sigma is not a function. of x. So all we have to estimate is only f of x. We do not have to estimate <laughs> the uh, distribution. Sadly, these observations are never true in life, but uh, practically any machine learning or any estimate approach you'll get will have these two assumptions. Because we saw these two assumptions, there is practically nothing that uh, we can do. And then uh, comes a really easy trick. So we have a set of observations, which are uh, x, i, y, i. And so we can actually say that the probability of all our observations is the product over the probability of each one of our observations which is P of X I, P of Y I given X I, 
which is pi over i p of x i for some kind of a dimension. Let's make it uh, just one dimension at this stage. Uh, e to the minus. Right, and again, I assumed here that sigma is not a function of xi. Now, given that, we can actually compute the log like the log likelihood, so the pro log probability of observing all of that, and we only care about the components of this function, which are somehow affected by f x i, because you would like them to take this function and try to find its maximum by derivating by the components of f of x i. So we can change the right likelihood, the log likelihood, to be sum over i, log p x i, and we don't really care about log p x i, because log p x i is not a function of fxi plus log of this constant, which you don't care about because sigma we just assume is not a function of xi plus uh, or minus sum over i yi minus fxi square divided by two sigma square. And then we will actually try <laughs> to maximize this thing, so basically to minimize. This value, which you all know, which is just a standard minimal least square, just treated as a maximum likelihood approach. Because we always try to, to treat machine learning as a maximum likelihood approach to try to maximize likelihood of our data. Now, in, in our case, we have a time to event, so we actually do not observe yi, we observe some time. So let's call this time tau i. So one approach is, if I do observe tau i, then everything is fine, and I actually compute that. If I do not observe tau i, then I ignore these cases because they have no information. So a classical machine learning would say only look at what you have. However, it's a really, really, really biased approach. Let's do the following experiment. Let's uh, compute how fast can I run between here and the entrance to the university. But I'll stop the experiment after a minute. So anybody running faster than a minute will get there. Anybody running slower than a minute will be removed from my data. So my conclusion would definitely be that it always takes less than a minute to run to the entrance of the university, right? So you're laughing, but if you would take the literature about the time to event, approximately half the literature makes precisely this assumption. Only look at the data that you have, but the data that you have is sensor, okay? I mean, you can all think about people doing statistics on sensor data. You only look at the part of the population in which you're interested, you're censoring the part that do not fit what you're looking for, and you get any kind of result in statistics, right? Uh, with the most amazing and well-known definition of statistics, there are lies, there are dumb lies, and there are statistics. Right. So, uh, so that's definitely uh, a problematic approach. The second approach is called the Cox regression model. And the Cox regression model makes the following assumption. Cox regression model makes the assumption that uh, P of tau given x equal lambda of tau e to the power beta x. Okay, so 
that's a really, really strong assumption because you're assuming a functional form of your function, the function relating x to tau. And typically in machine learning, our goal is the following. <laughs> we have some input, we have some function. The function produces an output. <laughs> then we can produce a log likelihood of, of <coughs> y and f shell x. But we want the log likelihood to include the function as an as just a general definition of the function that we can put inside here any kind of function we would like. Is there a linear function or a combination of some uh, function basis? or neural networks with multiple layers or anything you want, we would like our approach to have fx, f of x not explicitly included in the log likelihood analysis. So the Cox regression model, which is the second most widely approach, says, well, let's solve this bias by using a very specific form. The advantage of this form is that when you compute the log likelihood, you can actually get rid of this term and then solve the function with no bugs. So Cox regression model is a one principle approach, but again, it's very, very limited to this specific uh, form. So to solve that came the topic solution. So the, uh, you all know Nadav Schnerb, right? So first time I gave a talk, uh, uh, in physics, he told me, in every talk, there are two parts. One part which is really interesting and well done and general enough, and then there is your part. <laughs> so I'm still in the part which is well done. Uh, yeah, so uh, Tobit came and Tobit tried to, uh, to solve the optimization function given the fact that uh, we're centered. So Tobit was formally limited, was probably defined for left centering. So only event that happened after some time. So after time uh, T, and not like the example I gave you before of event that happened until time T, but it's completely symmetrical. I'll just use the classical definition of Tobit, which is to look at left centering. So we ignore all the events that happened uh, before some uh, time t. So again, assume we have some uh, f of y. I still don't have the expert. I'm just looking at y at this stage, which is distributed normally around some uh, values. So f of y is an um, sigma. So it's just, again. And uh, with no lot of generosity, I just assume that sigma is one so that I don't have to carry uh, the sigma uh, all along. I can ask what's f of y given that y is given then some time t. So I can ask what the probability of the event, but I'm only looking at events after some time, okay? So that's really simple. That's f of y divided by the fact that y is bigger than t, and that would be just, so suppose I define this thing to be a phi of y, that would be phi of y. divided by one minus phi, big phi of t, or big phi of t is just the integral, I mean the error function, the error function, uh, to take into account that I'm only taking values after some time. And so I can actually now do regression, not using the likelihood of y like I had before, but actually doing the likelihood of y given that y is censored. And you can do the same analysis as I did now for a few minutes, and get uh, a loss of Tobit, which has, uh, in the regression that I did, would give the following uh, loss. 
So since it's a log of this event, then the first term will be just the nominator that I had before. So my general Toby class. is as follow. It's some constant, which is not a function of e to the of uh, f of x, so I don't care about it, minus sum over i tau i minus f x i spur, which is right. just like uh, before, minus, and then I have simply the log of the term that I have here below, or minus log one, minus phi, and again, phi is just the earth function, of uh, ti minus seven. And actually, Clovit have shown that this function is unbiased. So actually, I can compute so maximize this loss, or, or minimize this loss, or maximize probability, uh, and actually find an unbiased function of tau i uh, given uh, f x i. And Tobit was for a very long time one of the favorite approaches to the time to event because going back to the question about running to the gate, then you actually compute the time of running to the gate but you actually include in the prediction the fact that anyone that was more than one minute to the gate was disqualified. And so I have a term for those which were censored. And I have a term for those which were not censored. Up to now questions. Everything's clear. Perfect. And Tobit was really, really nice. The only trouble is that I remind you how we do it. So we have our function f xi, but you actually write it as a function of f of xi and all kinds of ways. Yeah. It seems that if you choose the, the, the tensor of uh, work, then you can get good, good evaluation. It's all about the... the right, right, right. Tobit is completely precise. It's 100% precise. And that's why for a long time, uh, well, it goes this way. Statisticians always use protrubration because they never use anything invented after 1970. <laughs> that's a statistician. Machine learning people use just regular regression and throw the center data because they don't care about being right, they just care about does it work or doesn't it work? So that's fine. So, uh, but anybody that was trying to do proper time to event was using the Tobit model, and the Tobit model is 100% legit and unbiased. For your naive example of running to the gate in a minute, and it seems that if you would take the correct amount of time, everybody can decide what is the correct one, you get good answers. Uh, no, I'll be, I'll be even more precise. Given enough data on each person, and even if I limit my time to 30 seconds, and I'll only get 5%, 10% of my data, if I include the term that says that I'm paying a penalty for being after one minute, I'll actually get an unbiased estimate. So the expected value of f of sign will be tau y. So Tobit is completely precise, okay? It has a really strange different problem, which is the following. When we do machine learning, we have a function xi, which is actually a function of xi in all kinds of words. Like, think about the regression. Then you're not doing, uh, you're not trying to, so suppose you say y is some function of x. Then you typically say that, for example, it's some over some base function, beta j pi j x. And actually, what you're trying to find are the beta. So in a more general function, you have a set of weights inside your function. What you're actually trying to find are your weights. To do that, you need to be able to derivate the loss. 
Now that's really easy derivable because you derivate by f of x and then you derivate f of x by the weight. So that's fine. However, this part is not. So there is no easy derivative to one minus r function. And so you cannot actually take this thing and plug it into a neural network or anything like that. But there is a solution to that, which is the following approximation. One minus phi of z equal approximately phi of z divided by z. So if you go to the tail of so the earth function, the what? what? It's also a good uh, approximation for the derivative? It's also a good approximation for the derivative for enough. From, so when this thing is small enough, okay? And now everything becomes easy because then you can actually put that here and you can actually get, instead of this term, log of phi of z and phi of z is e to the power minus something. So the log and z is the power of something can cancel minus log z. So really easy to derive it. However, here I deviated from the truth because I use this thing as a general term. Then when people use Tobit, they use the approximation which only holds very, very far away from uh, the center of the distribution. Which actually it's the fact that when people use Tobit in practically any data set used in any framework of machine learning, the data, the result is again biased. So summary up to now. Cox is not biased, but it assumes a very specific relation between X and the time to event. Uh, ignoring the sensor data is definitely biased. And Tobit by itself is not biased, but cannot be used in a machine learning. And Tobit, when approximate, when we use approximation that one minus pi of Z equal uh, into minus z squared divided by z is again biased. So we're stuck again with no solution to how to do time to event in a machine learning frame. So that's what we try to solve. Does it help you to improve the approximation? Well, it does. I think it takes z plus one half in the denominator. It's, uh, it does. It does, but the, all of these approximations are really far away from the center of the distribution. So they don't hold when phi of z is not really close to one. But why the problem in differentiating L function close to close to the center? Why is it? it what's, I mean, it's uh, because what's the derivative of this thing? It's one minus an integral. How do you derivate it formally? <laughs> there is no closed formula. For the derivative of log, log one minus the integral. Does it make an approximation close to z equals zero. Oh, so so yeah, so definitely. So you could actually try to say, because well, let's divide Tobit into all kinds of domain and let's do approximation in uh, all domains. <clears throat> that would be uh, one approach. I'm just saying where the, the literature stands. The literature stands in one model which is wrong, one model which is very, very limited, and one model which is completely correct. And so if you're using it in any kind of general framework where you don't need to derivate, then you're all fine. But as soon as you want to put it in a framework where you need to derivate this thing, it's a function of the variables better, then you cannot do it anymore and then you do approximation. But these approximations are extreme. So uh, that's why we invented ratio. Uh, and let me first explain uh, the uh, logic of ratio. Uh, okay, so uh, I have again, I get to the freedom and I have again the colloquium and everybody's trying to escape from the colloquium and run as fast as they can to go uh, to uh, the gate. However, for each person, I have some time tau sensor of fact. So at some stage, I stop observing uh, this person, and they obviously have tau event of i. And so if tau event of i is smaller than tau sensor of i, then I observe the event. 
And if tau event of i is larger than tau centered of i, then I do not observe. And uh, if you really care, put the equal sign wherever you want in any of those, but the probability of the equal sign is obviously zero, so we don't care about it. And so let's uh, define a function which is the centering time is depends on the event. So no, the centering time is never depends on the event, not the but the centering time may be individual, may differ from person to person. Okay, and now so let's define an indicator of uh, say observe, which we can denote as uh, di. So here di equals one, here di equal uh, zero. Now, obviously, if we observe everybody, then everything is everything is fine. Now, suppose you have a prediction. So suppose you have a prediction f x i for <coughs> the event uh, of i. So that's not the real time to event. That's actually my predicted time uh, to event. Let's look at uh, two possibilities. First possibility is that I predicted tau event of i to be after tau centering of i. Then everything is fine, why? Because I stopped looking for the guy running to the gate after 45 seconds. My prediction was that he would get to the gate in two minutes, but that's fine. I never saw that, but that's definitely legit because I actually stopped looking after 45 seconds. <laughs> However, suppose my prediction of the time to event would be before the center of time. In such a case, I would actually expect to see the event. Now, I didn't see it. I only observed the sensor, which means that somehow, my estimate is wrong because I'm estimating way too low, too early. <clears throat> and so I should pay a price for this case, but I should not pay a price for this case because this case is completely fine. I mean, I predicted that it's going to be after some stage, okay? And it was after some stage, so everything is fine. But if I predicted it was before the TCI and it did not happen, then I should have to pay an error for that. Now let's see how big is my error. So that's, uh, that's the real time to event. That's my predicted time to event. All I know is that the real time to event is after the sensor. So my error is at least this component, right? So if I would put an additional error in my loss, I would actually put the difference between the predicted event and the centering event square, but only for events that happened before the centering event, that were predicted to happen before the centering and not predicted to happen after the centering. So that's basically the entire logic uh, of ratio, just to add the loss, if you're predicting f of x to be before the centering for a case that was centered. So now let's do it a little bit more formally. So since we cannot solve sort of it explicitly, we have to do some assumption. And since this assumption is not a good assumption, we're doing another assumption. So we have a few more assumptions. So assumption one is that censoring is not a function of x. So you can have a censoring and I can have a different censoring, but the censoring event is happening for some other reason. But, but you do assume that there is a correlation between the XI and the event. 
event is definitely a function of xi, but censoring but is not a function. Happens, so if the event is far, is far from us, there is more chance to... Obviously, the chance check. of observing the censoring is a function of xi, but the chance of the censoring itself is not. But it does depend on the height. So, it so, depends so, on height. So, it depends on height. It, 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 it's a right. So think about it this way. Yeah, it depends on height, obviously. Okay, think about this way. I have a camera mm -hmm. and I'm filming everybody running away from my class. However, my camera tends to stop at some time. So, so when the camera stops, I cannot see them getting to the gate, right? Now, for some person, it may stop after 20 seconds. And for another one, it may stop after, I don't know, an hour. So each one has a different censoring time. That was really strange. <laughs> Okay. But the censoring is an independent event. event. But the censoring is an independent event of the time. Now, obviously, if you're going to the gate within a second, the chance that censoring would happen is, is practically none. Because right. the event would happen before the censoring. Mm -hmm. But the event of the censoring. Okay, so you differentiate between censoring and the. And right. So basically, what I assume is the following For everybody on Earth, <laughs> there are two events the event itself and the centering event. Okay? The correlation between these no two, it depends on I or no correlation? There is, so, so those two events are completely independent. Completely. But both depend on X I and X I. No, only this one depends on X I. Do you assume anything about it on the sensor? Ah, okay. It's a random or... Okay, so, so that assumption. Okay, I'll get to that. Uh, Assumption. You know, I mean, so the sensor, the censoring time is not a function of XI, right. but the it's fact of whether censoring occurred or not is a function of XI. Definitely, like, yeah. yeah. Definitely. So again, I assume the formal formal setup <clears throat> for everybody is going to be an event, which is by the way wrong. Because often some people actually do not want to the get, they want to the other way. Yeah. Right? So for them, there is actually no TE, never. Okay, so that's definitely a wrong assumption, but that's still the general assumption done in all these frameworks. We're trying now to resolve that and to do a model where we actually give us this assumption too, but at this stage, we have the assumption that at some time, which is a function of Xi, everybody will have the event. That's like assuming it's very, very low. No, but it's then, not the same thing. It will always be sense of it's not, it's not the same thing because I'm assuming that there is some relation between Xi and Ti, and f of xi is a finite function. And so now if I put an event that will never happen and I wait it forever, it never happened, that's going to bias my function quite in a crazy way because actually there is no TEI for this specific person. Okay, so I'm putting that aside. At this stage, I'm assuming that for everybody, there's going to be an event TEI. And for everybody, there's going to be an event. Tau CI, because at some stage my camera will stop. The only question is which will happen first. If the event happened first, then I see the event. If the censoring happened first, then I see the censoring. Assumption two is that suppose we have a time scale tau. I use too many tau. Uh, and Eta. Suppose I have a time scale eta for the censoring. Then I assume that sigma is much, much smaller than eta, which is a crucial assumption. So now let's see what sigma is. So there is this tau, this event here. And there is the real function fxi relating xi to tau ei. But tau ei is not fxi. Tau ei has a distribution with some with sigma around fxi. Because I can predict how fast somebody would run to the gate. And so suppose I know that somebody is really fit and, and runs, it should take him just, I don't know, 45 seconds, but he may fall along the way or somebody may prevent him from passing or I don't know, any kind of freedom or the me. So there is a distribution 
of tau e i again around f x i. I remind you that this distribution was a source of the minimal least square result that we had before because we assumed the normal distribution of t i around f x i. So I do the second assumption, which is that suppose now I have a change of the centering event. So this centering event is changing. The probability of the centering event is changing. I'm assuming that the rate of change of this thing is much smaller than the rate of change, uh, than the width of the distribution. Okay? And actually, in most of the assumptions, we do assume the following things. We can do a third assumption, which is more extreme, which is that censoring is an exponential. Exponential. Distributed variable with uh, with some rate. Okay, so that's a more extreme assumption. It means that at every second I throw a dice if the dice. Uh, is one or, or head. I do censoring, otherwise I keep waiting and there is a probability for head at every time. So I assume that the probability of censoring is actually not only a, not a function of xi, but it's actually a completely random event with a constant rate. All along again, that's assumption we don't really need, but it really helps us along the way. So the, this assumption is that the expected censoring time to is much larger than the standard deviation of the... Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that it's much larger than f of xi, okay. but only it that it's that much if f large... Is, if f is less than sensoring, then it's... Precisely, precisely. Which means that suppose um, this is the sensoring time for some kind of event, then from the point of view of the sensoring time, it doesn't really matter if I look at tau ei, or fxi, because the width of the distribution of tau ei around fxi is much, much smaller than the ch change rate <laughs> of the sensor. Okay? So now everything becomes really easy. If we have these assumptions, <clears throat> in the fifth exponential distribution, because it's easier to compute? Uh, well, actually, when we did uh, numerical experiments, we did not assume that. But when we want to prove analytical things, then it's really easy to derivate because so. And also, that's the most natural assumption, right? That there is no reason for censoring rate to change over time. Now, it can change over time. It may be more complicated. But if I would have to pick any kind of distribution, that definitely would be a distribution that I would pick. Right. Okay. So now uh, let's look at the old cases. Let's first look at the cases where we observe. Oh, I have to say something, which is probably more important than everything they've said here. Uh, this work is a work of a really talented uh, student of Shri Chitosel. Uh, she's really amazing. She's been like three and a half years in the lab. Uh, she's published eight papers. Yeah. That's just one of her papers. And she just gave birth last week uh, to her third boy. So, uh, okay. so uh, so suppose we, uh, we observe the event, then what's the probability of observing the event, so the probability of xi tau i is the following. It's obviously the probability of xi, which I don't care about. And then the probability of observing and the probability of uh, observing. Observing given xi and the probability 
of a tau i with q times x i and the product. Okay. That's not a function of fxi, so I don't care. So that's easy. Uh, this part is simply, we already know that we observe the event. Okay, and we already know xi, so that's just the distribution of tau i around fxi, so that's again, n uh, tau i minus fxi sigma, just like before. Now, the probability of observing given xi is just the probability that the event, the centering event, happened after fxi, right? Which is simply <laughs> giving us e to the minus eta fxi. But the theorem is uh, not to be precise. You observe the effect that you assume it was observed it, it affects the. Well, it's not precise because now CI may have happened here, right? And so it's not a real normal distribution, it's a truncated normal distribution. But I remind you that we assume that this is very narrow uh, compared to this time. The question is, is that if you bias in one direction always. So, yeah, but since I assume it's so narrow, then basically I assume that either the censoring happened here or the censoring happened here, but the chance that the censoring happened here is very small. So first, that giving get when we do the log likelihood, we get a really strange thing. We get that for these terms, the loss is the following: sum over i tau i minus f x i square divided by two sigma square. That's just what we had before. But you got an extra term when we do the log of that. We get minus eta. Side, which was quite unexpected, but actually, when you just take the censoring time and estimate eta and add that to the loss, that's actually correcting a lot of the bias. Okay, so that's for the observed data. So, conclusion one it's not enough to have the minimal least square, you need a correction for the censoring event, even on the observed features. I'm not talking about the censored one. Now let's look at uh, the center duck. And eta and sigma are parameters that you estimate or assume? So I typically assume, for the sake of simplicity, that a sigma is one, because actually you can rescale the problem, because you only have one real free parameter here, and they have to estimate that. Okay, now let's look at center at centered events. Centered events are uh, more complicated. Okay. So now let's look at the distribution of the cumulative distribution of sensor. And that's tau. Okay. And now, Suppose that fxi is here and tau ci is here. Remember, I don't care about the, the log likelihood. I only care about the derivative of the log likelihood as a function of fxi. Now, what happens to the derivative of the log likelihood far enough into the cumulative distribution function, it's completely flat. Okay, so if fxi is much bigger than tau, then actually fxi has no effect of tau on tau. Because if I derivate the event that I had a centered event 
tube of fxi, and fxi is a lot after tau ci, then the derivative as a function of fxi will be zero. And so I can actually ignore cases where fxi is much bigger than uh, tau. So that's one case. The other alternative case is where fxi is actually smaller than tau. Now that's tau, tau centering. Now that's strange because why should I observe the centering if I should have observed the event? The only reason this should happen is the following, is that although fxi was smaller than tau, actually the event itself was slightly after fxi. When you do that, and I'm not going to get into the details because my time is running out, then you actually get an additional term, which is the following sum over tau centering i minus fxi square sigma square multiplied by the indicator that fxi is smaller. Yeah. So remember, I want to compute the log likelihood. And then if I'm using the log likelihood, the weights that are hidden inside the FXI. So the way I do it is that I derivate, I derivate the log likelihood as a function of FXI, then I derivate FXI as a function of the parameter. But look at the log likelihood here. It's completely flat. Okay, because remember in the topic to get here, the cumulative distribution of the centering event. And that's completely flat. That's actually practically independent of FXI. And so when I'm going to derivate that, I'm going to get practically zero. But and so basically it's the only term that we get an additional addition to this one is the term which is pretty equivalent to this one, except that you actually do it only for the cases where fxi is smaller than tau ci and there was censoring. Now to check that, we took, there was a database of 70 time to event prediction models uh, and we compared all of them, and with no exception, the error that you get when you do this model is either smaller or much smaller than any of those are existing models all around, just by adding these two terms. The fact that you need to compute the probability of not being censored and observed, and the adding this, uh, this one-sided uh, a minimal least square term for the sensor. So that was the first part uh, of the analysis. So if I would have slides, I would have shown you, but I do have a better than slides. Thank you. I don't know how they did it to show the figure, just printed on paper. Okay, so we use uh, three different measures of success, either AUC or of course, or confidence index, or uh, I mean, or accuracy. This case, this axis is here, is a case where we're worse than the state of the art. Everything which is positive we're better than the state of the art. I mean, it's really easy to do statistics to see that wherever we test our model, we're better than the state of the art. Then perhaps we just go a few cases. So that's one part. Uh, that's a part that's been under review now with three rounds for more than two years. So I hope we're done now. Uh, I really hope. Uh, okay. How much time do I have?
Eight minutes. Oh, great. Great. So now I want to talk about something completely different. And that's data augmentation. So uh, what's data augmentation? So suppose I want to find, so suppose you have some points, let's say these points are pluses, these points are minuses, and I want to find a curve that's separating the pluses and the minuses, okay? Statistically, obviously, because they have some classes which happens to be on the other side of the curve, but typically minuses are on this side and uh, classes are on this side. Quite often in machine learning, we don't have enough data. So, what do you do when you don't have enough data? You lie. So, you invent new data. So, I would actually like to have points here. Why would I like to have points here? Because the points here are actually the ones that would best delineate the line separating the plus and the minus, right? So if I could just invent new points and decide for these points here, is there plus or minus, I could actually draw the line quite precisely separating the pluses from the minuses. So that's indeed a problem because how, how on earth can you invent data and invent a label for, uh, for this data? So that's another work uh, she did, which is quite elegant. And it says the following things. Suppose I have a relation between X and Y. And suppose for some reason on earth, X can be divided into two components, X1 and X2. For this thing is trustworthy and this thing is not. So I really trust X1. For example, X1 can be precise and low dimensional but I don't trust at all X2. For example, X2 is what I got from my clinician with a lot of biological data, and I never trust it. How's it? The data. Then I could actually use X2 to try to invent a Y. Now that's typically quite stupid. Why? Because you already have Y here, and so you don't really need to invent a Y for a point that you already have. But then let's go to our setup where our data can be divided into two kinds of cases. For some of the observations, you have the observation, but for some of the observation, you have a sensor. Okay. Now I have cases where I know why. And I have cases where I have no clue why it's why, except that it's bigger than the centering. In such a case, says you can now go take X2 and create a new relation. So if you take X2, you create a new relation between X1 and no event one, which is the following event. Suppose I would take X2 to predict events. Now I can actually this use prediction to assign a time to event to this point. And now I use this time to event as an additional event point for X1. When you actually do that, so let's, let's draw it and axis. I have the real T. I only observed TC1. Now I created a machine relating X1 <laughs> to T1, TI, but I don't have TI in this case. So what I do is I invent a new machine relating FX2I 
to a predicted TI, which I'll call T i hat. And then when I learn the machine for FX one I, I use all the data because X2 just gave me a new point, which is T i hat. So I won't get into the details, but that's actually showing that you can actually augment data to get uh, basically translating any time, center time to event prediction to an uncensored uh, prediction. So I hope it was clear enough and it sells too much jargon of machine learning. But I just wanted to show you that using a relatively simple model, you can drastically improve uh, time to event prediction. We had a few assumptions which are very strong. And the strongest assumption was that for everybody, tau I will ever happen. And that's drastically biasing our results. But I hope that all here will uh, get me a model who sells this assumption. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from me? We're fine. We're